Greetings and welcome to the United States Transhumanist Party Virtual Enlightenment Salon. My name is Janati Stoliaroff II, and I am the chairman of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. Here we hold conversations with some of the world's leading thinkers in longevity, science, technology, philosophy, and politics. Like the philosophers of the Age of Enlightenment, we aim to connect every field of human endeavor and arrive at new insights to achieve longer lives greater rationality, and the progress of our civilization. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our U.S. Transhumanist Party Virtual Enlightenment Salon of March 19th, 2023. We have a fascinating conversation in store for you today on vaccine law and some of the challenges in regard to vaccine innovation, as well as how we can accelerate such innovation in order to protect more people against deadly diseases. Joining us today, we have our panel of U.S. Transhumanist Party officers and guests, including our vice chairman for the next four months and director of visual arts, Art Ramon Garcia, our director of longevity outreach, Ben Balweg, our legislative director, Jason Geringer, our friend Gary Abramson, who was our previous Virtual Enlightenment Salon guest on August 8th, 2021. I would encourage you to watch that salon. And our special guest for today is Brian Dean Abramson, who is the chair of the National Vaccine Law Conference Committee. He is also the primary author of the legal treatise Vaccine, Vaccination, and Immunization Law the most comprehensive treatise written with respect to this field of law, published by Bloomberg Law in cooperation with the American Health Law Association in November 2018, and regularly updated thereafter. And a second print edition of this treatise was published by AHLA in February 2022. He teaches the subject as adjunct professor of vaccine law at the Florida International University College of Law. So, we are very pleased to have Brian Abramson and his legal expertise on this fascinating subject. He has an introductory presentation on vaccine law and the acceleration of vaccine innovations. So welcome, Brian, and please feel free to begin. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the Transhumanist Party for having me as a speaker. And this is, this is a fascinating area of law. I find it to be one of the most fascinating areas uh, because there are so many subtle ways in which law generally uh, bends towards the public policy of having a society that is fully protected against the spread of contagious diseases to the extent that is technologically possible. And, you know, really vaccines, the invention of vaccines were one of the first things that ever happened in human history um, that enabled the human body to be modified, uh, even a, a healthy human body, to be modified prospectively against a threat to life and health. Um, so I will get right into the slides. Now, this, this talk is focusing on the intellectual property aspects of vaccines, and those are really portable to a lot of technologies that can improve and extend human life. Uh, there are four basic kinds of intellectual property. There are patents, which are applied to inventions. Uh, they have to be a patentable subject matter. Uh, there's sort of a long, long going story that, you know, someone with itchy feet walking in a patch of grass who suddenly realized his feet had stopped itching, couldn't claim to have invented whatever it was in the, in the grass that that prevented that itch, which could be something that could be sold in the market, but uh, they might be able to get a patent on a process of extracting whatever it is from the grass that stopped that itch. It has to be something novel that doesn't already exist. It has to be something that's not obvious. So, you know, there's an old case where someone came up with making doorknobs out of ceramic instead of metal. And the court said, well, anybody who knows anything about materials knows that you could substitute these. So um, it's obvious. Um, and another important aspect of patents, uh, which is really um, becoming an issue in the modern time of invention becoming so accelerated, is that they have a 20-year term from the date of filing. And 
you know, if you go back 150 or 200 years, that makes a lot of sense that you would have this really long term because chances are nobody would invent something that was uh, a great uh, acceleration over whatever the current technology was in that period of time. Now inventions happen one after the other and they get piled up on top of each other. Uh, the other areas of intellectual property that are somewhat of less interest really to, to vaccine law and to pharmaceutical law in general are copyright. Uh, the Copyright Office says you cannot copyright DNA or RNA or a lot of chemical formulas and things of that sort. Um, it's for creative works. It has to be an original thing that's fixed in a medium. It lasts for the life of the author in 70 years, uh, but it's not something that's really going to be applicable to the, the kind of technology that's going to extend human lives. Um, and there's also trademark and trade dress, which is really just for identification of commercial products. And then there's trade secret, which is a very interesting one because it's a catch all for things that a manufacturer would know about how to make their product that nobody else knows. Um, and it can cover things that would be patentable or things that wouldn't be patentable. Um, with vaccines in general, one of the first steps that always happens in the process of developing the vaccine is you have to isolate a sample of the deadly virus uh, or whatever the substance is that you're, you're trying to develop immunity against. And there are cases where uh, an employee of a particular pharmaceutical company has snuck off in the middle of the night with the actual sample of the virus uh, or, or a portion of it to take that to a competitor. And that's a, a trade secret violation. Um, but that's, you know, an, an interesting thing that comes up in the law. Now, patents are designed to reward innovation. The idea is if I put the effort into inventing something new, then I can get the exclusive right to sell that thing for a period of time and make a lot of money off of it. Um, but there's always been sort of an ethical balance that comes out of that. So there's a famous interview where Edward R. Murrow uh, asked Dr. Jonas Salk, who had invented the polio vaccine, who owns this patent? Who owns the patent for the polio vaccine itself? And Dr. Salk said, well, the people, I would say, there is no patent. Could you patent the sun? And his question was directed at kind of two different aspects of it. One being, there's a general principle that you can't patent uh, articles of nature, uh, which goes back to walking in the grass. If you find the grass that makes your feet stop itching, you can't patent that grass because it just exists in nature. You've discovered it, not invented it. And then there's the second idea that you shouldn't patent and put intellectual property controls and limitations on something that is helpful to human health. It is preventing the spread of disease. It is potentially killing or crippling large numbers of people. Um, there was an old principle in the courts. There was a, there's a case called Funk Brothers Seed Company where some farmers had determined um, that they could inoculate plants from bacteria. Uh, now plants don't have a reactive immune system like animals do. So they have other mechanisms. Um, they evolve in such a way that they're attractive to certain good bacteria that will fight off bad bacteria uh, that would try to attack the plant. And these brothers developed a mix of good bacteria um, that interacted well with each other, which is very important because, you know, if the good bacteria are eating the bad bacteria. You don't want them to also eat other good bacteria uh, that are protecting the plant. They developed this good mix of bacteria and they tried to get a patent on it. And the court said, well, no, you can't do that because this is just a product of nature. And people have been mixing bacteria for a while, coming up with these mixes to defend plants for a while. Um, so it's not even that original. Um, and this was sort of the, the idea that the court carried forward for a long time up until the 1980s that really if you're talking about a living thing uh, or some collection of organisms or combination of organisms, you can't patent that at all. Uh, and that was the case up until 1980 when we had uh, the first patent granted for a genetically engineered bacteria that was designed to eat oil in case of oil spills. And the court finally decided, well, you know what, this can be patented because it's an original, um, it's, it's an invention of man. It's not something that could have come out of nature uh, by itself. Um, we have some principles that we've seen arise just in response to the COVID pandemic, 
where patents can be suspended during an emergency. Uh, so in March of 2020, the country of Israel suspended the patent of manufacturer Abvi, which is a pharmaceutical company, for a drug called Kaletra, uh, which was an AIDS treatment because it was thought that Kaletra could treat COVID-19. And by suspending that patent, uh, Israel had the ability to import generic products made in countries where Abby didn't have a patent. It's another important aspect of the patent system. It's country by country. And as the inventor of something, you could go around the world and get a patent in every country. That's very expensive. So people tend to get patents uh, either only in the United States or only in large markets. Europe has a kind of Europe-wide patent. Um, you get patents in, in these large markets and, and then the smaller countries aren't able to manufacture whatever it is that you're making anyway. Uh, and you can kind of control world production, but there will always be some countries that uh, you might get hung up on not getting a patent granted or something where they can make this thing. Um, and if it's a pharmaceutical product, make this thing generically. So Israel waived this patent so that they'd be able to import the, the chemical that Abby has a patent on uh, without Abby having a say in it. And Abby, they said to themselves, basically, well, we can't, we can't have this happening in a bunch of other countries. We can't have our, our patents waived. So we're going to voluntarily uh, state that we're not going to enforce our patents. And that very quickly led to patent pledges being issued by a lot of pharmaceutical companies saying, we're not going to enforce our patents, uh, including for COVID vaccines, any COVID vaccine that we come up with. Um, those patent pledges are not really legally enforceable. Um, you know, they're just kind of public relations statements. And that kind of played out in the past uh, past couple months when Moderna sued Pfizer for violating. Well, no, Moderna was one of these companies that said, we're not going to sue anybody who uh, violates our patents while this pandemic is going on. Now Moderna has sued Pfizer saying you're violating our mRNA patents. Uh, Moderna is making a very broad claim as to what their patents covered. And they basically said in their lawsuit, well, the pandemic is basically over. Um, there is no public health definition by which the pandemic is actually considered to be over. But because the patent pledge was just a PR statement in the first place, you know, they can just say, well, now we're considering it over. Uh, the Biden administration has joined a lot of other countries in saying that they support patent waiver. Uh, there is uh, some movement towards a World Health Organization treaty that would also enhance the ability of countries to waive patents for pharmaceutical products in an emergency. Um, and all of this goes to the fact that patents are protective and that people can use patents to stop technologies that they've invented and have some claim to from being used by others. Um, the flip side of that is, of course, infringement. What, what happens when the patent is infringed? Uh, we had a case in 2020 where a company called Allele Biotech sued Pfizer for using Allele's protein marker in the development of the COVID vaccines. And you would think that if countries are really intent on using patent waivers to stave off the pandemic, this would be the ideal case to say, well, this patent, um, Allele's patent should be waived or suspended for some period of time for the purpose of developing a COVID vaccine. Um, but that isn't what happened. And, and nobody kind of said, oh, yeah, we, we should do this. Um, Pfizer did try to use a safe harbor provision um, in U.S. law, which allows you to infringe on someone's patent for the purpose of testing something uh, to develop a competing product. And this was denied because Pfizer was not trying to make a protein marker. They were trying to make a vaccine. Um, so there is an idea that as long as you have competition, you want to encourage that by saying, well, if I want to figure out a way to invent around the other person's patent and make another product that does the same thing, I should be able to mess around with their invention and experiment with it. Um, but in this case, that wasn't what was happening. Uh, so the case ultimately settled, which almost all intellectual property litigation does because they're corporations and they're looking at the bottom line um, and are very 
outcome oriented as opposed to um, necessarily having emotional litigation where they're, they're not going to settle because they want to right some wrong or something like that. Um, but that's what happens in the field. And that brings us into the issue of patent thickets. So this is a chart showing um, patents and the, the numbers in these blue boxes are like the number of patents that these companies own. A patent thicket occurs where you have a complex technology that has a lot of components and there are patents on a lot of these different components. And the first major patent thicket that arose was actually in the 1850s with sewing machines, where someone had developed a new kind of needle that could thread the machine and someone else had developed a new kind of pedal that you could power the machine with. And there were other inventions that had other aspects to it, uh, which really sparked a textile revolution. And there was one company that managed to acquire all of these key patents and that was the Singer Sewing Machine Company. And that was um, 160, 170 years ago. And you still know the name Singer Sewing Machines and that's why, uh, because they were the ones that, that conquered that patent thicket. Um, but the patent thickets that we have today for things like vaccines um, or electronic products, your cell phone and automobile, there are instead of a dozen key patents involved, there are hundreds of them. And there are potentially hundreds of patent owners, and you have to deal with all of them. Um, so this chart shows patents that are being claimed, uh, starting with these what are called University of Pennsylvania legacy patents, um, that are some very old patents owned by the university for vaccine technology. Um, with all of these other companies that own some number of patents for some aspect of making the vaccines that we're using, for, particularly for making um, anything with mRNA technology. And you can see Moderna is there with hundreds of patents. BioNTech, which is the partner of Pfizer, has hundreds of patents. And all these other companies have hundreds of patents. And you run into situations, um, and this is something that is a concern for the development of any technology, that can improve the human condition, you run into situations where, let's say you have 30 patents, 28 patent owners say, yes, we agree to come in on the development of a technology that combines all these patents into something new and remarkable. And then you have the last two that are holdouts, or what we just call literally patent holdup. You have people saying, well, you know what, we want more for our patents than you're willing to pay. And you have two solutions at that point. Um, Either you can, in fact, pay this excess amount that they're demanding and kind of give into that, or you can invent around it. You can say, well, your patent does this particular thing. We can come up with a different technology that will do that thing. But often when you invent around it, you're coming up with a suboptimal solution. And that first patented technology is the optimal solution. And then you're incorporating something that's not quite optimal, but doesn't infringe that patent in order to uh, develop some new technology. And there's a, a real problem when we see this with, with a lot of electronic technologies and so forth, where the suboptimal solution then becomes the standard and it's very hard to change and move from that to the optimal solution, even when the original patent owner's patent expires. Um, and that's, you know, certainly it's not the, it's not the best outcome if you're talking about a cell phone or a, or a television or a personal computer, when you're talking about pharmaceutical products that uh, can extend human life and possibly cure cancer or fight some disease that we have uh, terrible trouble with, then, you know, you really want to have everything optimal uh, for the outcome of the individual whose body a technology is going to be put into for this purpose. So, you know, that is, that is a real problem. There have been legislative solutions proposed in the past to sort of force licensure on reasonable terms and so forth. Um, nothing has come about from that, but you know, that's, that's where we stand with patent thickets. Um, there is also an intersection with FDA regulation. So the patent system is designed to promote innovation by giving you this um, period of time when you have the exclusive right to use a product. FDA regulation is primarily supposed to protect the market from bad products. 
Um, about 120 years ago, there was an instance where there was a diphtheria antitoxin that was being distributed around the Midwest. And that, and that antitoxin was actually cultured in the blood of a horse named Jim. Uh, it was a retired milk horse who was kept in a, in a stable who had previously been exposed to diphtheria and was constantly producing the antitoxins. So they would take the, the blood of this horse and they would refine out the antitoxin and inject that into children and the children would be protected from diphtheria. And at some point, Jim um, maybe brushed against a rusty nail and got tetanus. And there was now tetanus in this, uh, in this solution of diphtheria antitoxin that got distributed around and a dozen children died. And because of that, the United States instituted uh, what became the predecessor to the Food and Drug Administration, it's the FDA Act, uh, the first federal law saying you have to have uh, some level of quality controls on biological products, which include vaccines, which are put out for people to use. Um, before the FDA, you had individual states with varying levels of regulation of pharmaceutical products. And this was the age of snake oil salesmen, people who would literally stand on a street corner with a bottle of something that they had mixed themselves, often something containing um, mixtures of things like cocaine and iodine and alcohol and um, some kind of roots or, or herbs or spices or something of that sort, and would claim this is a cure-all, it'll cure everything that ails you uh, from headaches to illnesses. Um, and those eventually fell under uh, federal regulation. The principal idea behind which is that you have to demonstrate that something is safe in order to sell it, and you have to demonstrate that it works. Um, so eventually, Congress came up with this idea that because it takes a long time to get a vaccine on the market uh, or another biological product on the market, we're going to give you an additional period of FDA regulatory exclusivity, meaning the FDA won't approve another product for the market, even if it's shown to be safe and effective, until you've had this certain period of time or you're exclusive on the market. And that kind of makes up for the fact that a lot of your patent time is eaten up by testing to uh, get your drug approved by the FDA. So you can get 12 years of guaranteed market exclusivity, uh, even if you take, even if you file your patent and then you spend 10 years testing your thing, instead of just having 10 years left, you would have 12 years left of market exclusivity, plus a period of data exclusivity where your data is, doesn't have to be shared. Um, and then on the flip side of that, if once that exclusivity expires, if someone can demonstrate that they have a biosimilar product, uh, which is a product that is chemically very similar and in clinical trials has basically the same outcomes, then they can get on the market with that very quickly um, in terms of the FDA process. But biosimilars are not generic drugs. Generic drugs are a different concept. Um, it's for a drug to be generic, you have to show this is the exact same chemical formula. We're able to replicate the chemical formula. You can't do that with biosimilars because biological products are magnitudes more complex um, than any kind of, of kind of chemical drug that you develop. Um, so they have this separate regime for them. Um, now, recently, we have seen a lot of private efforts to overturn FDA licensure. And this is very problematic um, from a perspective of just being able to put things on the market. Um, again, the purpose of the FDA is to kind of establish a floor of safety and effectiveness for a product. And we see now there are efforts to uh, have the courts overturn FDA licensure of products because people disapprove of the, per of the purpose of the product is being put towards. So right now, within the next couple of days, in fact, we're expecting a district court in Texas to overturn licensure of the abortion pill um, because there are places where they, well, we don't like abortion and therefore we don't want this technology to be available to people. And that's, that's very problematic. In fact, the state of Colorado has just passed a law outlawing the use of that pill, even though there are uses for it, uh, there are medical conditions that can be treated by it that have nothing to do with abortion. 
it's still going to be illegal to use to, to prescribe that pill or dispense that pill for any purpose. Uh, there have been multiple lawsuits filed to try and overturn FDA licensure of the COVID vaccines by people who don't agree with uh, mRNA vaccines, who uh, believe bad things about them that they've read on the internet. Um, the state of Idaho has a bill pending in the legislature, which would uh, ban the administration of any mRNA vaccine for any purpose. Of course, the only mRNA vaccines that exist now for humans are those COVID vaccines. There are some mRNA vaccines that have been around for a little longer for animals. Uh, and in fact, animal in the, in the animal industry, there are, if you have cattle or sheep or pigs, there are dozens of vaccines that you're required to administer to those animals. And um, the industries that are in charge make sure that they're administered um, very thoroughly and, and conscientiously because they're in it for commercial purposes. They don't want their herd to die from a disease uh, or to have a disease that's spread from another herd to theirs. Uh, and the, the Idaho bill would actually prohibit mRNA vaccines in humans or animals. Uh, so that's you know kind of remarkable. And then there's chatter out there that you can see where people are saying, well, medications or pharmaceutical products that are used as part of gender transitioning should be banned. Um, and you know, I haven't seen uh, anything saying that that pharmaceutical products that you know are are directed towards trans transhumanist ideas specifically should be banned, uh, and that would be kind of silly because there's no medication that doesn't you know potentially improve health or life, which is the the point of the entire movement. But going on Twitter uh, and other social media sites, you can very easily see there are people who think that transhumanists one, two, and here's one that I that I uh, highlighted, the one that I circled in red, want to invert the natural of orders of things. And this is somehow satanic and against God. Um, and kind of remarkably, if you go back well over 200 years, when the smallpox vaccine was first being uh, used to prevent that deadly disease, there were people, um, preachers who said, no, this shouldn't be allowed because God decides who lives or dies from deadly diseases. And if we give people a vaccine that prevents them from dying of smallpox, we're trying to thwart God's judgment. Um, and this was not a view that was like a fringe view. This was a lot of people uh, felt this way and contested against vaccination on these grounds. Um, and then you see there's also um, rhetoric out there that connects transhumanism specifically with vaccines, with mRNA vaccines. So this is all part of this transhumanist agenda or you know a big pharma slash transhumanist agenda. So there's a potential for uh, legislation in these areas where they're saying, well, the, the pharmaceutical products that we don't like that stand for things that are morally objectionable to us, we're going to try to uh, block those. And we're going to try and block those by saying that the FDA licensure of those products uh, should be removed. And, you know, it, it, it's kind of contrarian. You have a lot of people who, uh, on the one hand, are against excessive regulations and, on the other hand, are trying to, when it uh, goes against a certain moral point that they've adopted, are trying to use regulations to prevent the use of things that you know that can advance the human condition. So that is the whole of my uh, presentation. I, I tried to keep it short so we'd have a lot of time for discussion. And here you have my website and email address if anyone wants to email me or or chat with me on Twitter and so forth. And at this point, I think I can close the slideshow uh, or someone who has access to that can do that. And we can discuss this topic. Yes. Thank you very much, Brian. This was a fascinating presentation and it certainly delved into many aspects that would be quite important to discuss today, in particular because it illustrates the immense role for <coughs> policy and the importance of forward thinking policy decisions in order to help accelerate innovation and prevent some of these 
threats to innovation, as well as resolving the institutional obstacles to innovation like patent thickets. And in the U.S. Transhumanist Party platform, we have three sections that I would briefly like to highlight because I think they're important for this discussion. These are sections 81, 82, and 116. So section 81 states that the United States Transhumanist Party supports reforms to the patent system that prevent the repatenting of drugs and medical devices or the acquisition of any exclusive or monopoly rights over those drugs and devices once they've become generic or entered the public domain. Section 82 <clears throat> states that the U.S. Transhumanist Party supports efforts to reduce the lengths of times over which medical patents could be effective. So we think the 20 year time period is too long given the pace of medical innovation and your presentation addressed that quite eloquently. And then section 116 was specifically adopted in response to the COVID pandemic. And it states that the US Transhumanist Party supports the development of vaccines under conditions that do not afford patents to the developers, but instead compensate the developers in the form of bounties for safe, effective vaccines and their rapid production and development, specifically to prevent patent thickets and the kind of situation that we saw with Moderna suing Pfizer because the patent pledge was indeed a non-binding promise. And once it became convenient for Moderna to violate that promise, it did that. So I'd like to address each of these issues in turn, uh, first with regard to the repatenting of previously generic or public domain substances. And Alan Crowley had a question in our YouTube chat in this regard. Uh, he is wondering what about pharma companies making little so-called cosmetic changes to a drug, such as insulin, for instance, when, for instance, artificial insulin was publicly available for a long time, but then they would get another 20 years on the patent and would have the ability to artificially inflate the price of that drug or that device for consumers. Yes, and I, I agree that's something that should not be allowed uh, when something becomes generic. There shouldn't be any way to kind of pull it from the market. Um, and quite frankly, uh, there are some uh, in some businesses out there, some sectors out there that have a tremendous amount of uh, political power and sway and are able to keep things uh, under that kind of control much longer than they should mm -hmm. be. Um, now, as to insulin, anybody who has the, the kind of the technology, uh, the basic technology to make insulin that existed decades ago, uh, from expired patents, can manufacture insulin. There are barriers to entry beyond patents, um, <clears throat> but you know what the what the companies that manufacture insulin regularly do is they they do come up with um, improvements to the process, and they should be credited for the fact that there that there are improvements to the quality of whatever they're making. Um, but they do come up with relatively minor things um, that do have. Uh, some minimal effect in either improving the effectiveness of the product or the process uh, and are able to use those <clears throat> to maintain their control of the market for much longer um, than they should. And I will add that with vaccines, of course, this is substantially exacerbated because it is enormously difficult uh, to manufacture a vaccine in the first instance because we're talking about a biological product and it's it's vastly more complex than uh, basically a chemical like insulin. Um, but that is that is one issue that we have with the patent system is that it can be used, you know, we, we have this, this thing called submarine patents where people have patents that they, they don't even disclose um, until some point further along in the patent process where they can pop up and say to a competitor that's trying to do something new, aha, we already own a patent on this. Um, now you can't even uh, go forward with this process that you already started working to develop. Um, so yeah, that's a definite concern. And um, the way to address that, it's not entirely clear, uh, but one of the things that 
we do need to be doing is facilitating people who are trying to practice expired patents. In other words, if there's a patent that somebody else owns and I'm trying to make this thing um, that is no longer covered by a patent because it's expired, then there should be resources that make it easy for me to do that. Uh, and certainly the manufacturer of whatever that original thing is, isn't going to want me to do that. So, you know, they're, they're constantly going to try and uh, maintain a monopoly on whatever the resources are required to practice uh, something in competition against them. Yes, indeed. And actually in our chat, Empero raised the point that you made that the original insulin could still be made available by an independent nonprofit using the original manufacturing techniques. And Alan Crowley suggested maybe someone can start producing that on the cheap and bring down the excessive price of insulin. So fact, perhaps Mark there, Cuban is doing that. Right. Right. So perhaps there's room for resurrecting older manufacturing processes or older delivery technologies just to ensure affordability of these substances that have been in the public domain for a while. You don't need the latest delivery mechanism, whatever it is, if it's going to cost you several hundred dollars more. Right. And insulin is an interesting example because it's something that has such a wide uh, market of people who need insulin really to survive. Um, it gets into uh, more and more delicate territory when you get into drugs, you know, they may be AIDS drugs or cancer drugs or things like that, um, that there's a much smaller portion of the population that needs those. Uh, so it's not as cost effective necessarily for someone to get into the market as a generic manufacturer of them. Um, but, you know, certainly to the extent that that can be facilitated, uh, wherever there is some kind of uh, pharmaceutical product that can treat a fairly uh, decent size of the por uh, population, you know, there should be mechanisms to facilitate the practice of expired patents on those. Yes, and I, think we're, I think we're going to get to, uh, you know, I think artificial intelligence is going to boost this as well. Uh, you know, there are places where you can go where there are like maker studios, um, in, in various cities where you can like build things. Uh, you can't make pharmaceutical products at them, uh, but there's no reason that you couldn't have something that's sort of a facility that has all of the resources necessary to produce pharmaceutical products that different people with different interests come and commonly use that facility, um, you know, rent access to whatever the, the mechanisms are and make a variety of different things that are currently genericized. So there is room for the kind of decentralized, very much transhumanist spirit of innovation to be applied to the solution to this problem. And because a lot of these substances are in the public domain, technically an enthusiast could start essentially a, a DIY uh, type of approach to making these more available. I know there are biohacker collectives that might be interested in working on this. Uh, I, would think so. I would also point out that another barrier to entry there is that you have to have a facility that's inspected by the FDA. If you're, if you're, if you're putting anything out there that you're selling it or even giving it away, um, that is a product that falls under FDA regulation. So it's, it's something that's designed uh, with a claim that it will improve, you know, a health condition of some kind. Um, and that can be very expensive. You know, you, you have to, you have to meet whatever the guidelines are in terms of ventilation and sanitation and so forth. And you, you should be meeting those uh, if you're manufacturing something that people are going to be putting in their bodies. Um, but that is another kind of barrier to entry to markets that could be addressed by having either some kind of a common facility um, or resources available to help people to develop the right kind of manufacturing space for whatever it is that they want to develop. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Now, on the subject of patent terms, so right now the term of a patent in the United States is 20 years. My understanding is the terms used to be shorter, but there was an option to extend them. And 
in the early 2000s, there was a change to the law that essentially uh, transformed the patent terms into fixed 20 year terms with no option for an extension. And then the US patent system used to be a first to invent system, but this recently changed to a first to file system, which is problematic in many regards in my view, because somebody could genuinely invent a new device, but they might not have the money for a patent application or for whatever reason, somebody else got there first, got to the patent office first and submitted the application, even though they might not have been nearly as far along to actually realizing that device as uh, another inventor. So I'm curious what you think would be viable solutions to these issues. Obviously, uh, we would want in the U.S. Transhumanist Party to shorten the term of patents and to go back to a first to invent system that seems to be a lot more fair if you want to reward the original creator. But there's also the possibility in many fields of just stating that certain technologies, whether it be because of a health emergency or for some other public health considerations are not patentable, but instead subject to bounties where the government or some consortium would generously compensate the original inventors in exchange for this technology being made available in the public domain so that other inventors could then essentially leverage it for future advances. Uh, well, I will say, first off, quite frankly, I am a, I am a first to file advocate as opposed to first to invent. And the idea is um, you you do have on occasion someone invents something um, and they know they've invented something new, um, but they sit on it for a while uh, before filing the patent application because they know it's a 20 year patent. And if they wait two years before they file that, that patent, um, you know, and they get their, their production together and so forth during that time, then they'll have 20 years from that date of filing um, as opposed to, you know, having to worry about um, someone else coming in and filing earlier than them. You know, if you think about it that way, then the person who's sitting on a patent today and deciding I'm not going to file it in, until two years from now is going to have that patent protection for 22 years from now. Um, whereas when you have a first to file system, that creates a huge incentive for that person to say, well, someone else might file it tomorrow. I don't know who else is, you know, working on this invention and, and, and developing this. It's really in my interest to file that patent right away. And then instead of expiring 22 years from now, it'll expire 20 years from now, you have a slightly shorter period of time during which they have that exclusive right over it. Um, although at the same time, you know, I do understand the concern that someone might not have uh, the resources to file a patent application. It's not that expensive. I think it's three hundred dollars uh, for the filing fee. Um, although there are there are maintenance fees once you have a patent that that can pile up and be in the thousands of dollars. Um, but you know, certainly, to the extent that technology requires uh, patents, or that no one, no pharmaceutical company or no major uh, entity in the industry is going to start manufacturing something until they have patents on it, um, you know, then it is, it is facilitative to encourage people to file their patents as early as possible. Um, and there are people who have invented things, you know, there are, there are a couple of cases of this where someone has invented something and they just never bothered to file a patent on it because, um, you know, it was a curiosity for them to do the inventing. It wasn't something they were planning on putting on the market. But then later when somebody else did file a patent uh, and put an invention on the market, that original inventor would come around and say, oh, well, I, I actually invented this and I should be getting all this money from it and I'm going to sue you. And here's my research that shows that I was, you know, my documentation that shows I was the first to invent this. Um, and you don't want people to be um, reticent to put innovations into the market just because they're fearful that someone else has uh, without disclosing it, um, invented something that then they can go and take all of your profits. So there are, are balances uh, to be weighed out in terms of all of these issues. Um, in terms of having an alternative system, 
uh, bounties as opposed to patents. Um, that's something that we, we could do right now. You know, the, the, the U.S. government uh, contracted with a bunch of pharmaceutical companies at the outset of this pandemic and said, we're going to give you a billion dollars each to come up with a COVID uh, vaccine and we'll pre-order X number of doses for it. And there was really nothing in those agreements that limited the uh, inventors of those vaccines from patenting their technology and uh, enforcing those patents, expressing those patents in some way. Again, the, they made patent pledges. Um, for the most part, they kind of held to those for the first uh, two years of research and in, into which uh, the development of the COVID vaccines was the product. But ultimately, you know, now they want to collect. They want they want their you now not just the enormous amount of money that they got from the government from um, these contracts to develop these vaccines, but now they want to sue their competitors who they feel have uh, infringed on patents that they have. Um, and of course, you may have heard that they're planning to to massively. Um, jack up the prices for COVID vaccines now that the government's no longer kind of paying for them and making them freely available to everyone. Uh, of course, there's a degree to which the government will still be paying for that because they'll be covered by Medicare and Medicaid and programs such as that. But then it's still coming out of somebody's pocket. You know, it's coming out of taxpayer pockets and going into the coffers of these pharmaceutical companies. And it's it's purely profiteering. Um you know, the, the argument you'll always get from pharmaceutical companies is, well, we're reinvesting this uh, and developing new products to um, you know, improve public health and so forth. But they're also doing very well financially, all the, the people who are uh, officers and, and investors in these companies. So it's, it's really not all about uh, the public good. And uh, yeah, there, there certainly are models for ways to do that. Um, it is certainly possible for a patent owner um, or for the inventor of a technology to waive their patent as Jonas Salt did with the, the polio vaccine. Um, he didn't formally waive a patent, but he basically, he didn't file for a patent for things that he could have patented uh, and dedicated that technology to the public good. And we saw massive reductions in polio. And, and now we're at the, the point where you know, really at the, at the outset of the COVID pandemic, we had almost eradicated polio from the face of the earth. You know, there are only a few pockets of uh, endemic polio left on the planet. Um, and a lot of those efforts were hampered and, and fell back by a couple of years due to the, the COVID pandemic. Um, and they're falling back more now because um, some aspects of the way that the COVID pandemic was handled have led to increased distrust in vaccines, lowered polio vaccination rates, uh, which means we could have a, a loss of herd immunity in the United States and we could see people getting polio again. And you know, obviously if you're in the transhumanist movement and you want to extol health and long life, um, you certainly don't wanna be at risk of polio or at risk of um, your children contracting polio or, or being exposed to it. So that is that is a very troublesome thing. You know, we as a society are all better protected from diseases like that and measles, uh, even varicella and influenza, uh, where there are high vaccination rates. So it's it's problematic to see those declines. Um, but that's the the situation that we're facing now. Yes, and and <laughs> that is uh, indeed quite unfortunate. And with regard to the increased prevalence of polio and that being driven by anti-vaccination sentiment. Of course, you touched on how some people even extend that more broadly to demonize transhumanism. This is going to be definitely a public relations battle that we are going to need to fight because I maintain the mRNA vaccines saved many millions of lives. And even if they did not completely protect people from breakthrough infections once the SARS-CoV-2 virus mutated. At the very least, they delayed the time at which many people got COVID. 
and that meant that those people were exposed to more moderate strains like the Omicron subvariants, which are still dangerous and they still can cause long COVID as my personal experience can attest, but it's generally a milder acute experience and milder long COVID. I'm mostly recovered from my long COVID, whereas a lot of people who got long COVID from the original strain are still unfortunately suffering from it. So the vaccines did do an important job. And it saddens me that a lot of people, just because the vaccines did not do a perfect job, have gathered ammunition, essentially, to try to attack vaccinations more generally, including life-saving vaccinations like the polio vaccine. But it's interesting that Jonas Salk dedicated the polio vaccine to the public domain. Do you think in a first-to-file system that would be possible? Because it would seem that Right now, if another Jonas Salk comes along and he says, well, I want my invention to be in the public domain, then inventor B, who might have come up with it uh, 10 months later, uh, would decide, oh, uh, I'm going to file a patent anyway, and he would get the patent for 20 years. Is there a way to prevent that uh, other than the original inventor filing the patent and then saying, I'm not going to enforce it, or now I dedicate this invention to the public domain? Um, well, there, there are two aspects to that. Um, one, yes, what you, you would generally need to do is have the original inventor, in fact, file a patent um, and thereby incur the costs of filing a patent. Um, and, you know, I think it would be useful if, if you knew somebody had invented something that would be broadly useful and wanted to dedicate that to the public domain, uh, it would be nice if there were resources available to help them file that patent um, and then engage in whatever uh, whatever language or contractual statement that they would need to dedicate it to the public domain. So that's definitely, you know, a, a one prospect. Uh, the other thing is that, um, again, you have to be an inventor of something. So if it can be demonstrated that something, you know, was kind of, uh, previously on the market, there's a, there's a thing called the on sale bar, where if something is on sale on the market for a year or more, um, then it can't be patented uh, because it's already out there on the market. Uh, and that goes both to the inventor of the product um, and to anybody else who might put it on the market, even if the inventor hasn't bothered doing that. So, you know, if, if you're able to put something in the market and have it out there, uh, on sale for a year and demonstrate that it's been uh, out there for a year uh, before anybody else is able to file a patent claiming they've invented it. Um, that would be an alternate way to do that. Um, you know, absent a change to the law, you know, maybe the law should be that if someone wants to dedicate a patent to the public, uh, to put it in the public domain, then the filing fees and maintenance fees should be waived. Uh, I think that would make a tremendous amount of sense. That's not the law now. And I think there are probably a lot of entities out there that would contest or object to that because it's in their interests to have um, to have barriers to uh, doing things like that in case they want to file a patent and make money off of something that, that uh, ostensibly somebody else invented but doesn't want to get a patent on. So, you know, there, there might be challenges in doing that, but I think that would be that would be a good direction to take that to say that, you know, there should be mechanisms in place to eliminate costs for people who are just trying to dedicate something to the public domain. I like that idea. It's not something I thought about before. Now, now it's a, it's a new thing that, uh, that you've put in my mind that I like. Yes, indeed. And this seems to be a sufficiently incremental reform that it could get a broad spectrum of political support, even though you said some entities would oppose it, their opposition would be seen as essentially a brazen attempt to maintain barriers to entry because here's the possibility of some inventors who out of generosity, out of concern for the well-being of humanity, would wish to dedicate these inventions to the public domain. And we don't want special interests to try to stop those acts of generosity just out of a desire for additional financial gain. Speaking of additional financial gain, as you pointed out, 
Pfizer and Moderna and other vaccine developers did receive generous support from the U.S. federal government. Mm -hmm. And this is why Moderna's lawsuit against Pfizer struck me as particularly egregious at the time that it was submitted, Mm -hmm. because it does seem like an instance of double dipping, that even if legally they could pursue it uh, out of considerations for the public benefit, they should have been satisfied with the generous support they received from the federal government. And the idea that the pandemic is over in any way, shape or form strikes me as quite disingenuous. Mike Lazine raises a question, who would have the right to claim that the pandemic is over? Who has the rights to decide that? I would say there needs to be a consensus of all of the major health organizations in the world based on medical criteria that the pandemic is over and uh, COVID enters some other stage. Right now, there are no epidemiological signs of that anywhere on the horizon. One could say, well, socially, a lot of people have decided to behave as if the pandemic is over, but they're just engaged in wishful thinking, it seems, because the virus is still very much out there, very much spreading and contagious, and the new variants are more contagious, even though they may be milder in severity. So my question is, what can be done to prevent this kind of litigation, especially in the midst of a health emergency, when it's clearly going to reduce the vaccine supply if Moderna prevails? And moreover, if these manufacturers start charging patients for vaccines, that's going to reduce vaccine uptake even further. We already have very low uptake of the recent bivalent boosters. So if people have to pay hundreds of dollars per dose, how many people other than the most ardent supporters of vaccination are even going to bother with that, especially because it's not socially as encouraged as it used to be? Do you foresee a way of solving this that a lot of politicians at least could be brought on board to support? Um, well, I have I have a few thoughts on that. Um, First of all, I don't think that Moderna's success in this litigation would actually reduce the supply of vaccines. I think we would. I think what this will end up with is a settlement where Pfizer pays Moderna some amount of money, and then both Pfizer and Moderna continue producing uh, the vaccines that they produced. Um, in terms of double dipping, I will say that if you look at it strictly from a contractual point of view, um, the government. U.S. government and probably other national governments paid Moderna a big chunk of money in exchange for Moderna developing this vaccine and then providing a certain number of doses. And once Moderna does those things, it has fulfilled its obligations under the contract and can do whatever it wants with its technology and its claim of ownership of that. Um, so that's that's not something that can be retroactively fixed. You know that that was the agreement that was struck, and it did not speak to limitations on Moderna's future imposition of its uh, patents uh, on the market. Uh, I will also say that you know everyone's kind of entitled to their opinion on the quality of the lawsuit itself. There are people I've spoken to uh, who have different views on that. Um, I think Moderna is biting off a lot in terms of what it's claiming. So, you know, I don't know that um, I would say that they're, they're, you know, if it actually went to uh, a final fact finding uh, determination, that the, the finer fact would say that uh, Pfizer has uh, egregiously uh, infringed Moderna's patents. Uh, although a lot of patent litigation starts off with like really big claims and ends up with a court finding, well, you did you know, have this very minor infringement of this one uh, claim or this one patent or this one element of this one patent, and you have to pay some amount for that. Um, But again, I think this is, you know, again, this is my opinion. I think this is a lawsuit that was filed to bring about a settlement and it will result in a settlement. um, And it'll be, you know, the sort of thing that that Moderna is unhappy because it's not enough and Pfizer is unhappy because they think it's too much. But it won't be. Uh, it won't have a, as massive an impact on the market as uh, people tend to think. Um, and you know, I I do think that there is a a tremendous problem in the fact that um, 
mRNA technologies uh, as they developed were first, um, you know, kind of broadly used in this way in a vaccine just because there has been an anti-vaccine movement uh, for a very long time. You know, there's not like an anti-chemotherapy movement or, you know, there's no other, there's no other pharmaceutical product where there's this movement against this product. Um, but the anti-vaccine movement has been very strong for a long time. Um, first of all, because there's this now discredited uh, Andrew Wakefield claim that max vaccines were connected with autism. Um, and secondly, because, you know, there are legitimate concerns about the degree to which government can require people to receive a product for which, you know, some small number uh, will have an adverse reaction. And in that way, you know, vaccines are like um, peanuts. There's a very small proportion of the population that will have a serious allergic reaction to peanuts. If we had a law saying everyone has to be fed peanuts as a child um, for some health benefit, um, and you know there, there was just this consequence of this small number of people having a really bad reaction to that, people would react in that way. Um, but the fact that mRNA technology first came into broad public view in connection with vaccines as opposed to in connection with a cancer treatment or something like that, has led to um, this massive kind of um, opposition to mRNA technology among the people who are opposed to uh, vaccination and vaccination mandates uh, and a kind of a demonization of mRNA technology. And that's really unfortunate because, you know, it's this, it's this really marvelous toolbox of technology to be able to say, we're going to, to put something in you that instructs your cells to behave in a way they don't normally behave uh, to your benefit. And indeed, you know, it's prospectively possible that you could use mRNA technology uh, for people who have diabetes or have insulin generation issues to get their, their cells generating insulin again, like the way they're supposed to be. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I see there's a comment in the chat about the use of um, fetal tissues. And I will, I will disclose to you the fact that there are tens of thousands of pharmaceutical products on the market that have been tested on um, aborted human fetal tissues. That's because it's necessary to see how will a, any pharmaceutical product react with um, the human, with human cells. Uh, and there's, there's a process through which pharmaceutical products are tested. And you probably are familiar with the clinical trial process. The first thing you have to do is test them on animals uh, that have some analog to human systems. So if there's an animal, if you're, if you're testing a liver drug, you find an animal that whose liver cells are close to or similar to similar enough to human liver cells, you test it on that animal. But at some point you have to make sure that, you know, no matter what animals you tested this on, this will be safe for humans. And one way to do that is to test it on uh, embryonic stem cells. Um, and really, you know, we're, it, there's not, there's not a lot of, you know, people are, there are people aren't going out and getting abortions just so they can um, have these stem cells that they can use to test pharmaceutical products on. Um, a lot of uh, this testing is done on lines of cells that come from a couple of abortions that were performed in the 1960s. And then the uh, embryonic cells from those were harvested by scientists and um, cultured so that you could duplicate them generation after generation. So it's not as though there's there's even there are even new abortions being uh, performed in order to, to get material to test things on. On the other hand, I've actually proposed myself that you know there are a certain number of miscarriages that happen every year, um, and if you could harvest the embryonic stem cells from uh, these miscarried children and create a bank of stem cells from that, uh, then you could have the supplies needed to test pharmaceutical products on embryonic cells for which no abortion is implicated. And that at least in theory should lift the concerns of people who say, oh, well, these products are tested on, um, on aborted fetal cells. Uh, 
you know, that, that, that's something I would like to see done. I don't know if uh, anyone out there thinks it's fruitful to do that. Like if any of the, the pharmaceutical companies that have these lines of stem cells that they've purchased in the past um, from these decades uh, prior abortions would think it's, it's worth their investment. But I think it would be just to say that, okay, you know, there are people who have a religious objection or a moral objection to the use of aborted fetal cells. Well, here's an option that doesn't require that. Um, and that's, that's something I've had in mind for some time. Um, and, you know, certainly would be glad to work on an effort to bring that about. Um, now I feel I've, I've gone off track a little bit. So if, if you want to reel me in and, and, um, direct me towards particular issues uh, to answer that, that you had brought up in your previous question. I'm glad to do that as well. Yes, hey, certainly. That was super interesting. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I will say, I will say a few things and okay. then uh, we can go to the panel's questions. So first of all, on the subject of essentially a bank of cells from miscarried fetuses, I think that's a great idea because it could resolve the social controversy, just like induced pluripotent stem cells largely resolve the social controversy over embryonic stem cell research. The problem with embryonic stem cell research, according to certain so-called pro-life groups, was that they uh, that research was reliant on embryos that could have been used uh, to conceive a child. However, with induced pluripotent stem cells, you could take a somatic uh, stem cell and essentially uh, de-differentiate it back into an embryonic stem cell. And, and that kind of obviated the entire social controversy. So anything that obviates social controversies, whatever side of the controversy one is on, I think is desirable. And that's the kind of creative solution that we support in the US Transhumanist Party. I want well, to say that also that I think the objections to fetal stem cell um, testing in vaccines, there, there, are only, there are only a few vaccines um, for which that was a vital component of their development, um, is more of an excuse that is used by the anti-vaccine community to kind of, here's a, here's a basis for opposing, uh, as opposed to, you know, a real moral objection, because you don't see um, the same people objecting to thousands of other drugs that are tested in the same way. Um, but to the extent that it takes away a rhetorical quill, um, that is uh, that is certainly a useful direction to pursue. Continue. Yes, yes, indeed. And we certainly want to deprive the anti-vaxxers of any kinds of rhetorical arguments uh, that they might be able to deploy. Maria and Trigus Abramson in our YouTube chat points out the definition of a pandemic, a widespread occurrence of an infectious disease over a whole country or the world at a particular time. So by that definition, the COVID pandemic is still going on. And John H. writes, many people are thinking and acting like it's a done deal, but it is still the third leading cause of death in the U.S. The last time he looked, about 2,500 to 3,000 Americans a week are sent to early and probably unnecessary graves. And Sergei Gukin also points out that Omicron is milder only because it causes a response while it is in the upper airwaves and so it is less likely to be invasive but if it does reach the lungs it can be just as severe and dangerous and john h points out that omicron is just as capable of creating long-term consequences and mecfs is an acronym for myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome. This is essentially an extreme type of response that could be part of long COVID that some people who have had long COVID for years uh, have essentially developed. And it is true that if the Omicron case becomes quite severe, then it could have these severe long lasting consequences just as the original strain did. So this is why it is important to continue protecting people against exposure and infection. And vaccines can play an important role, particularly if they can become more universal against 
various strains of yes. the virus. And that will be an important innovation uh, to see if uh, we can encourage through better policy. But I, I want to... I would add to that, there are over 8,000 identified species in uh, the family Coronaviridae that are known to exist in the wild and have never been known to cross over into human populations. So, you know, and, and anyone, you know, they could, they could be something that has no effect on people, or they could be something that is the next COVID or the next SARS or MERS. Um, so, you know, really we have to have, uh, we have to have some effort to get the, the public aware of the fact that, you know, this is not the last pandemic we're going to have. Um, and there might be one uh, around the corner that's worse. And then we need to be prepared for that and be prepared to, to develop quickly and deploy and, and have uptake of vaccines for whatever the next thing is. Yes, absolutely. And now, Jason, you had some comments. So let us hear what you have to say. Yeah, about the, uh, the COVID is still going on. I heard that, you know, China, it's still ripping bad through China right now. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I had heard they had stayed locked down for a long time. And uh, I, I don't I don't know if this part's true, but I also kind of heard that their vaccines aren't as good as ours. I don't does anybody know anything about that? Uh, I do. <laughs> and, uh, that's, that's probably correct. Um, you know, they, they, they've gone through the same vaccine development process and their COVID vaccines that they're using in, in China, uh, to my knowledge, are not mRNA vaccines. Um, there are cultured cell vaccines like Johnson and Johnson um, and uh, AstraZeneca and Novartis. Um, and, you know, they just, they have a different process for, for putting these forward. Um, I suspect that their clinical trial subjects um, aren't doing the full kind of informed consent thing. Um, you know, beyond that, uh, yeah, you know, China went through a process even more abbreviated than was done in the United States and didn't have the level of technology um, that US manufacturers started off with because uh, in the US, we have been working with mRNA technology for uh, nearly 40 years. Um, you know, it's it's not as new as people think. Um, whereas, you know, China did the sort of old fashioned thing, isolate a, a sample of the, the virus breed it to the point where um, it's not as harmful and we can inject this uh, this kind of sanitized version into people and still have them um, have an immune response. Um, so, you know, I, my, my, uh, my in-laws uh, are Chinese. They recently moved to the United States just in the, in the past couple of months. And they had multiple rounds of vaccination while they were in China. Um, but China also uh, really focused on uh, if, an, uh, an economically in society and practical zero COVID policy where people were just locked down. If there was a, a COVID case detected in a certain apartment building, they would literally seal the doors of that apartment you know, all the complex and nobody who lives in the building would be able to come or go for a certain number of weeks. Um, and it, you know, once they kind of rip that bandaid off. Yeah, now now COVID is all over China. Um, and that was inevitably going to happen. There's just there's there's no practical way to say, okay, we're just going to, you know, seal people in their houses and think that that's going to prevent the problem forever. You're just going to have uh, a lot of people who are waiting to be the, the first subjects to spread it around. Um, and there are a couple of other COVID vaccines in the world. Um, I will take the opportunity to harp on the Russian COVID vaccine, which is just garbage and has like a 50% protection rate. Uh, but a lot of countries are using it because they were selling it very cheaply. Uh, so, you know, there, there are things out there that are COVID vaccines that are less effective. Um, and I will also say that no vaccine for any disease is 100% effective. It's impossible to achieve that. Um, there are vaccines that are, that are highly effective, uh, but you know, a vaccine does not erect a magical shield around your body that prevents a virus from, from entering your body. What it does is 
it prompts your immune system to be as ready and as aggressive as possible in dealing with that virus once it's detected in your body. So, you know, you don't have an immune response to something until it starts doing something in your body. Um, and I know early on when the COVID vaccine was released, Rachel Maddow said on her show that it stops the virus 100%, you get the vaccine and, and it'll end. And it just wasn't true. Um, and people have pointed to that and said, well, you know, this is what we were led to believe and, and it's not the case. Um, and in fact, you know, the, the truth of it is that, that no one who understands vaccines would ever have said, okay, this will, this will stop at a hundred percent. And, um, you know, there'll be zero infections for people who are vaccinated and zero transmission. Uh, there are always going to be some infections. There's always going to be some transmission. The vaccine reduces that uh, massively. And, you know, to that effect, if, if we had a much higher uh, vaccination rate in the population in this country and in the world, then there would be a lot less COVID transmission. And there would also be a lot less mutation because the mutation is a function of the um, rate of transmission. And less mutation would mean that you know, you'd have fewer potential variants that are more infectious. And that's what always happens with diseases is the most infectious variant will be the one that spreads the most. It'll be the most successful. Um, and there will always be mutations and you know something, some will be harmless and some will be more infectious than the last one, possibly more infectious, but less deadly, but also, you know, it's a coin flip. It could be more infectious and more deadly. So I've, I've kind of uh, gone on. About <laughs> it's good. I'm glad you mentioned the thing about the RNA uh, that it had been in development though for a long time, because that was another thing that I heard that actually kind of sounded like maybe might, there might be logic to it, but because it was like, well, it, how could how could they come out with this vaccine so fast? It took us this many years to do all this other stuff. How could they do that? And if you explain that more, that'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, mRNA technology fundamentally is just this really solid good idea. Uh, we know that our cells uh, use mRNA to decide, you know, how do we repair ourselves? What do we produce uh, chemically? Uh, within ourselves to um, maintain equilibrium and, and the health of the cell, which is a component of the health of the body. Um, so the idea has been out there almost as long as, as knowledge of mRNA, the existence of mRNA has been out there that may, may <coughs> maybe there's some way we could manipulate the mRNA to do things that are favorable for us. And if you think about it, you know, what a virus is doing, what any virus is doing is it's invading your cell, <clears throat> it's injecting something into your cell that takes over your cell's repair mechanism and uses that to make something that it's not supposed to make. In, in the case of virus, it uses it to make copies of the virus. Um, and if a virus can do that, and that's just something floating around in the world that, you know, floating around in nature that can get into a body and, and take over your cells and make them do something they're not supposed to do, well, if we can harness that to our benefit and put something in the body that makes the cell make a drug that you need to survive um, <clears throat> or, you know, make something that counteracts uh, something that you're not naturally and biologically prepared for. Or again, if you have uh, diabetes, if you have uh, a problem with the, the development, you know, if like I, I take a thyroid medication, I, you know, my, my thyroid doesn't produce as much as it's supposed to. Well, an mRNA uh, technology could instruct the cells uh, in my body that are supposed to be doing that to do what they're supposed to do. And then I wouldn't need to take a, a thyroid pill anymore. Um, and that's something that's uh, been in contemplation for just you know decades and decades. Um, and the first real work was begun on that um, in the late 1970s, early 1980s. Um, and that wasn't contemplating mRNA vaccines at all. That was contemplating mRNA treatments for cancer uh, and other conditions like that. Um, and that's that's research that's been going on for a long time. And there are mRNA vaccines that have been developed for animals. Um, but really what happened uh, with COVID was we had SARS. 
and we had SARS in the <clears throat> mid 2000s. And one of the immediate responses was, well, let's see if we can develop a SARS vaccine um, using an mRNA platform. And uh, companies that had access to that technology started working on it. But then the SARS pandemic went away really quickly. So they had all this work that they did for SARS that got put on the shelf. Um, and as soon as COVID came around, they're like, hey, we've started creating a platform for a for an mRNA vaccine for something in the coronavirus sphere. We'll pull that off the shelf and make a make a an mRNA COVID vaccine with it. And they did that. Um, and it was just because, you know, they, they kind of started it. It's like, you know, when you when you start a woodworking project and you're like, oh, I don't have time for this, you put it on the shelf, and then all of a sudden you need whatever the thing is, you can just finish it real quickly. But that's really what happened with uh, with the COVID mRNA vaccines. They just took this, this uh, they unshelved this technology, and we have what we have from it. Um, and it was very accelerated still in terms of the clinical trial process in putting it out there. Um, and we are still learning things about how effective mRNA vaccines are. Um, I just want to throw out there, by the way, what I have heard recently is the Novartis vaccine uh, seems to have a really long tail for immunity as a booster, although it's not available in the United States as a booster, which is um, unfortunate. Apparently, you have to have had the original Novartis uh, series in order to, to get a Novartis booster. And very few people did because the, the ones that came out originally um, were the Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson and Moderna. But, um, you know, I'm certainly for the next booster I need to get, I'm going to try and get a Novartis booster um, because I, you know, from what I've heard, it gives really long lasting protection. Um, and that's what you want in a vaccine. You want to have the, the long lasting protection. Mm -hmm. Yes, quite interesting. Now let us go to Gary Abramson, who has a question. Yes, uh, I would just start by saying I currently have COVID right now for the first time, which I actually contracted at a health technology conference of all places uh, where no one was wearing masks uh, indoors, even though uh, my wife and I were. Um, my question, which I think really goes towards the a longer term transhumanist perspective. Um, as I'm sure everyone knows, there were uh, babies born in China that were engineered to be uh, basically immune to HIV because of a, a, a genetic modification that prevented HIV from actually, uh, I guess, binding into, uh, in, into their cells. Uh, it, within the realm of immunization and vaccination law would what what do you think are the uh, the implications for this uh brian what do you think uh, issues might arise especially as it um and if it even would happen with around so here you have it, it, just two quick things one is like a, an instance where it's administered to a fetus and therefore it becomes part of the gene line so if those children have children they'll pass on that gene versus say an adult uh, who may have a future CRISPR, uh, um, I guess you could say it's an immunization if it would even be characterized as such that would provide immunity, but may not necessarily be passed forward into the gene line. Um, I'd love your perspective on that. Well, the first thing I would like to say is, it's obvious to me that the reason that you have contracted COVID is uh, because of divine judgment, God clearly has judged that you deserve to be punished for something and has inflicted that upon you. Um, I can imagine any number of, of, of things that you've done in the past that, that would merit that. Um, but secondly, with respect to genetic engineering, you know, it, it, one of the main areas of potential advance in vaccines generally is the idea that we'll have um, custom vaccines that are calculated to be most effective with the genome of a particular individual. So right now, you know, vaccines are scattershot. They're broad, um, they're a broad solution where we have people who have different levels of um, reactivity to the vaccine. You know, uh, again, it is known that every vaccine has some small number of people 
uh, and it's usually sort of one in a million cases where they're going to have a bad reaction to that vaccine. Um, but further to that, there are some people, and it's usually a fairly small proportion of people for whom the vaccine will not engender uh, the desired immune response. And the vaccine might have no harmful effect on them whatsoever. It just might not be effective for them. Um, and that is because of something in their own genetic makeup that makes their immune system less responsive to uh, this particular stimuli. Uh, so one area that it's being heavily researched is can we tailor the vaccine so that it will be effective to this particular person? We get a DNA sample from this person and see, you know, what is necessary to, to do with this vaccine to ensure that uh, it won't be harmful to them, you know, it won't have an adverse uh, effect on them, and it will be effective in stimulating their immune system. Now, what you're talking about is a kind of a next level thing where uh, instead of giving people individual vaccines that stimulate the immune system to develop the normal immune response, uh, you genetically modify them in some way so that their immune system um, prospectively, you know, there, there are a couple of different ways you could do that. You could make the immune system far more robust by itself, um, which of course also yield some potential hazards because there are a number of diseases that occur because someone's immune system attacks their own body because it's too robust. Um, so that would have to be something that would be very carefully calculated and refined. Um, but you could also build into the immune system the fact that uh, from the outset before this person is born uh, through a genetic modification rather than um, through something that is specifically stimulating the immune system to respond that their immune system will produce the diphtheria antitoxin and produce um, whatever uh, whatever immunological factors are required so that um, if a particular uh, virus enters the body, it already has the, the protein markers that normally attach to the virus. You know, the, the, the reactive immune system is a remarkable thing. What happens um, when a virus enters your body is your, your body um, sends out uh, cells that examine like, what are the causes of cell death that are going on? So the virus will come in, it'll invade your cell, um, it'll cause damage to it, it'll cause chemicals to leak from the cell. Uh, your body knows there's something going on, your immune system knows there's something going on where there is cell death occurring and it sends different kinds of cells that are capable of literally feeling the molecular surfaces of what's going on and, and sending uh, signals back to the productive elements of the immune system that say, produce something that will stick to this uh, virus, something that, you know, here's what its molecular surface is like, here's a chemical that will stick to that molecular surface, and that will signal the white blood cells to come and devour uh, whatever the virus is. Um, and to the extent that, you know, you can get your body to produce chemicals that in advance that will stick to particular uh, types of invasive cells. And, you know, right now with the, with the COVID vaccines, they're all uh, designed to attack the spike protein um, or to stimulate a response at least to the spike protein uh, that the COVID, the COVID virus uses to attach to lung surfaces and, and other cell surfaces. Um, so that's feasible, certainly. Um, the question is, how aggressively would you want to go with that? Um, there's also kind of uh, an idea that, you know, we eradicated smallpox from the face of the earth. No one needs a smallpox vaccine anymore. You know, kids don't get smallpox vaccines anymore because smallpox no longer exists. So there is certainly a question of how uh, do we allocate resources towards do we protect people from the spread of a particular disease um, or do we really go after eradication of that disease? And there are some diseases, there are some by their nature that can't be eradicated. You'll never eradicate the flu because it uh, is so transformative in its evolution um, and because it can pass through animal carriers and so forth um, and you can't go out and vaccinate all the animals. But uh, measles, could be eradicated. And in fact, rinderpest, which is measles in cattle, has been eradicated because all the cows got vaccinated for it. 
Um, so, you know, there's a little bit of frustration to the fact that we could eradicate measles from the earth in humans, and then no one would need a measles vaccination ever again. Um, but we're, we're unable to accomplish that because there's um, resistance to vaccination. And in some pockets of the world, in third world countries, uh, there's just not the, the mechanism of the ability to fully vaccinate those populations. You know, as I was saying before, we almost eradicated polio from the world. And then um, that fell off because we didn't have a vaccination campaign uh, that was able to, to continue during the COVID pandemic during the early stages of that. Um, so for some diseases, I think, you know, really the focus should be on eradication and just let's get everybody vaccinated for the things that can be removed from the planet and then never worry about those again. And then for others like influenza and quite frankly, like COVID, COVID's probably never going away now. Um, it just may, it will just be modified in terms of how it interacts with human society. There are things that we could do uh, at the embryonic level, at the genetic level that would make people and their descendants and their descendants' descendants um, have a very strong immune response to COVID going forward. And, you know, I certainly have no, no moral objection to that. Uh, I can imagine that people who are anti-vax would go nuts if you were talking about, you know, genetically modifying fetuses for this purpose. Quite interesting. And by the way, I was actually vaccinated against smallpox because in the former Soviet Union, they were still vaccinating infants. So I have the skin patch on my shoulder. How old are you? 35. Yeah, you, you'd be like the last generation of people who are vaccinated for smallpox. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. I I were. So Alan Crowley points out in our chat that smallpox only exists in containment labs right now. Mm -hmm. And I think it's ill-advised to keep any exemplars of that virus around. But in the event of an outbreak from a lab leak, hypothetically, of smallpox, I would be protected. Now, in regard to vaccine innovations targeting something other than the spike protein, I think would be important for future vaccine technologies because that could render vaccines more robust against future mutations of the virus, given that the spike proteins of each subsequent variant and subvariant are so different. Now, I wanted to ask Jose Cordero to uh, pose his questions right now, because Jose has joined us from Spain. Uh, hello. Thank you so much for this very interesting presentation. And I am a fan of the messenger RNA vaccines. I believe this is a fantastic new technology. And actually, I have read that Moderna, uh, BioNTech, Pfizer, and other companies are thinking about using mRNA vaccines for cancer, for malaria, and for HIV AIDS. And I find that totally incredible, fascinating, fantastic, because they are totally different diseases. Cancer is your own cells that uh, mutate and begin uh, overproducing cells. Um, HIV AIDS is a foreign virus and uh, malaria is a parasite. So it, it is incredible that this technology is so powerful that can be used for any of these diseases. So my take uh, is that uh, we should uh, move forward with these technologies, but what do you hear about um, these companies working on these technologies? As I mentioned for these uh, new or uh, different diseases, cancer, malaria, HIV, and uh, international differences because I am now in Europe and in Europe it is not the uh, same regulations, even though most European uh, countries, the European Union follows a lot the FDA. So I would love to hear your comments on uh, uh, what is happening next with the vaccines and differences with Europe. Well, the first thing I would say is that um, there are already vaccines that protect against cancer. The HPV vaccine protects against a virus which is uh, associated uh, with cervical cancer and a few other uh, more rare kinds of cancers. And since HPV vaccination has um, broadly occurred in the United States, cervical cancer rates have dropped 65%. Um, 
which is remarkable. And there are other vaccines out there. I think even the measles vaccine uh, where determinations have been made that vaccination for those diseases has correlated with a drop in the rates of certain cancers. Uh, and you know it's not entirely understood what the relationship between a viral infection and cancer is, um, but it's very clear in the case of HPV um, that this this the virus is the cause of the cancer. Uh, so, to the extent that other cancers might be uh, discovered to be related to viral infections, um, then we might develop vaccines, and there there might be viruses that are endemic to the population that don't cause an immediate reaction. You know, we, we, we think about COVID and influenza and um, measles, mumps, rubella, those kinds of viruses, because you get them and you have this immediate response. Um, there are some viruses, the shingles virus is, is a great example, um, where it gets in the body and it stays dormant for, for decades possibly. And you don't have that immediate sickness and death, but you do have a later health consequence of the virus being in your body. And it may be discovered that um, there are other cancers uh, that occur in the body to which there is a viral triggering component uh, where a vaccine would prevent people from um, ever getting that cancer in the first place. Um, I think liver cancer is another one, the hepatitis B vaccination has been shown to reduce instances of liver cancer. Uh, so that's that's one step towards towards ways in which any vaccine and mRNA vaccines are a particularly potent model of vaccines um, can combat cancers. Um, and then the, the second thing I would say is that mRNA technology generally, even if you don't think about it in terms of a vaccine, um, you know, and there, and there may be a degree to which people now associate mRNA with vaccines and say that, okay, if you have an mRNA treatment um, for, uh, for a cancer or for heart disease or something like that, people are going to think of it as though it were a vaccine when it's uh, really not something that, that quite fits into that paradigm. Um, you know, that's something that we have to be aware there will be uh, social objections to by those who are opposed to vaccination just because they have that association in mind. Um, but also we're at the, the front door of, an, uh, of a limitless technology. Uh, you know, we're, we're in the Wright brothers flying at Kitty Hawk stage of air travel uh, when it comes to deployment of, of mRNA vaccines, development of mRNA vaccines. You know, we're a decade away from um, being, you know, at the World War One biplane stage, and then another couple decades away from being at the fighter jet stage. Probably, it's probably going to be a, a much faster progression than that, actually, because technology, all technology, advances much more quickly these days because of the mechanisms for the advance of technology itself. But yeah, you know, we're 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 at, we're at the biplane stage of something that will be a fighter jet in a couple of years in terms of uh, its ability to um, affect and improve human health. And, you know, we're, we're lucky to be in the generation that gets to see that develop. Yes, how indeed. about Europe? How about differences with the European Union? Um, I am not hugely familiar with the EU's um, kind of pharmaceutical regimen. I know that, that most every country in the world has the same basic um, structure of, okay, we're going to require proof of first safety and secondly, efficacy of any drug that's marketed. Um, there are certainly countries where that's less enforced uh, or where they're more lax. Um, and in fact, there are international treaties that most countries in the world are a party to, which set floors for uh, the quality of pharmaceutical products that are sold internationally because most pharmaceutical products are. Uh, and that even allow uh, officials from one country's um, health department or health secretariat to inspect factories uh, and manufacturing processes in other countries to make sure 
they accord with the baseline for that country. So we have people from other countries coming to the United States um, regularly to inspect pharmaceutical manufacturing facilities the same way our own FDA inspects those to determine that we're in accordance with whatever their requirements are. Um, and conversely, we have FDA officials going to different countries around the world where pharmaceutical products are manufactured and inspecting their facilities. Um, I think uh, Sanofi's manufacturing facilities are in France and so forth. Um, there are some things that are manufactured in Australia. And I guess it must be a really nice job, you know, to be the, the FDA person whose job is, okay, you have to go to France and Australia and maybe some other countries like that uh, to inspect their factories and have meetings with people there and then um, maybe take some time to do a junket on your own. Uh, but yeah, we, we have those systems in place and they're very active. Um, and there is that kind of um, observance of what are the, the pharmaceutical laws of other countries um, in ensuring that products are effective worldwide. Yes, thank you very much, Gary. And now let us go to Ben Balweg. Thanks for being here, Brian. Um, I wanted to ask about something that we've just kind of been like teasing at so far today, um, non-communicable diseases. I wonder what the regulatory hurdles will be to uh, um, NCD vaccines for, call it cancer, hypertension, diabetes, atherosclerosis, mm -hmm. beyond just infectious diseases. Oh yeah, and there's a tremendous amount of work being done uh, in just all different sorts of areas for that. Um, now, if you if you kind of go back to the beginning of vaccines, one of the earliest vaccines and one of those that is commonly uh, dispensed these days is the tetanus vaccine. And tetanus is not a communicable disease. It's not a disease that one person can pass to another person. It's something that occurs in a bacteria that's just sort of out there in the world. Um, tends to congregate on certain kinds of environments and people can get infected with it anywhere, anytime. Um, there was recently a case in, I believe it was Oregon, where there was a family that was non-vaccinating and one of their children um, stepped on something and got tetanus and ended up needing $80,000 worth of medical care um, to cure that infection. Uh, you know, so that's, there, there certainly are things that are out there environmentally that are not communicable diseases that can be vaccinated against. Um, and in fact, there are prospectively vaccines in development against drug addiction. And the idea of a, of a drug addiction vaccine is, well, a drug is effective, an addictive drug is effective because there's some chemical that crosses the blood brain barrier and causes you to have um, an endorphin response or a hormonal response that, you know, it's a very positive experience for your brain. You become addicted to that. Um, and you can, you can uh, develop a vaccine that causes the immune system to attack whatever that chemical is so that it never crosses that barrier so that all of a sudden heroin does nothing for you or nicotine does nothing for you. You know, you no longer have a response to it. Um, and that's also highly controversial. Like, well, do you, do you give this to your kids in the anticipation they might someday try heroin? Um, do you have the courts mandate that drug addicts receive, receive these vaccines? Um, but yeah, the, the potentialities are, are just unimaginable. Um, there's also a degree to which it's a question, do you still call it a vaccine? If it, that's you know the sort of thing that it's doing, if it's not, um, if it's not prompting the immune system to develop a response to a contagious disease. Um, there are certainly purists I know in the vaccine manufacturing field who don't want to discuss those things in the context of being vaccines. They want to say, well, they're just therapies or they're treatments or they're something else. Um, but putting the niceties aside and the terminological disputes aside, um, there is tremendous potential upside to develop these technologies. And there is uh, no end to the work that is being done uh, towards their development. And I do think we are going to develop mRNA-based uh, cancer therapies, mRNA-based 
um, diabetes treatments, uh, therapies for heart disease, perhaps Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and things of those sorts. You know, and they're not they're not just about stimulating the immune system uh, to do something. So a vaccine fundamentally is something that stimulates the immune system to develop an immunological response. Um, whereas if we're using mRNA technology to get cells to produce um, insulin or thyroid or some, some chemical that's going to prevent uh, plaques from forming in the brain or things of that sort, then we're beyond the realm of vaccines, but we're using technology that um, certainly has begun in the vaccine context and has had a tremendous uh, impetus for its creation in the vaccination context, context and is developable and portable from that point outwards. Yes, thank you for that response, Brian. And we have about nine minutes left in our salon today. I would like to give Art Ramon the opportunity to ask a question and then we will go to closing remarks. So Art Ramon, please go ahead. Yeah, as far as like say gene therapies, um, what sort of uh, what sort of pet would that be if you can say correct scarring, like people who are burned if you can create some sort of gene therapy for that to correct, to get the, the cells to quit doing what they normally do with the scar tissue and just revert back to regular skin tissue. Uh, Cause I know they, they have a design patent. Would that ever be used for that type of gene therapy? Well, a design patent is a very specific and unusual kind of thing. And it's really for stuff that's not patentable. Otherwise um, we're, we're, you know, design patents are kind of like, almost for for configurations of things that should normally be considered trademark or trade dress. Uh, so you can get a design patent on the design of a hat or something like that that doesn't have any um, functionality to it. Um, when you're talking about developing therapies, you're talking about sort of regular utility patents. Uh, so it's, you know, here is something that is configured to have a certain result. Um, and you can patent uh, the, the mechanism or the technology or um, the process. And you know, within utility patents, there are, there are patents for, for mechanisms and patents for processes. Um, and a process is, you know, here are the series of steps that you take to achieve this outcome. And I've invented a series of steps that can be taken uh, that will in fact result in that outcome. Um, and with a more mechanical patent, you know, for something like a pharmaceutical product, you can say, well, here is an actual chemical formula that will have this outcome. And I have the patent on this formula. So either way, uh, those are just utility patents. And it doesn't really matter, you know, if you're talking about descarification, it's still a process. It's either a process or a product that leads to that descarification. And the patent that you're getting is on, on one of those things. So it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a design patent, but, uh, in terms of. It looks like we yeah, lost Brian for a moment. Yeah. I, I kind of wanted to follow up and ask him, suppose a particular eye color, like a pattern, an actual pattern in your iris. Uh, if that would be uh, a design patent, but yeah, it looks like he dropped off. Well, it seems that naturally occurring traits cannot be patented, like having blonde hair or having brown hair cannot be patented. And as Brian pointed out in his presentation, biologically occurring organisms cannot be patented. So naturally occurring bacteria used uh, for any particular purpose cannot be patented, but synthetically generated organisms can be patented. So uh, genetically engineered bacteria could be patented, for example. Now, I would like to ask any of the panelists to provide their feedback, their impressions of today's session, uh, Jason, please go ahead. And I, I'll try to get Brian back on. 
I loved that idea he had about the, uh, it was like a, a maker space lab thing. <laughs> that, 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 I wonder what that would even look like. I mean, what does a regular maker space have? Like a 3D printer? What would a, a maker space lab have in it? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know, a centrifuge maybe, or I don't know what's in the lab. I wonder how, I wonder how that could work. That's well, idea. we have Brian back on now, so perhaps uh, he could share some of his ideas in this regard, essentially with a connection to producing substances or treatments that are in the public domain now, at least using earlier uh, production technologies do you perhaps have some ideas of what that might entail? What kinds of facilities, uh, what kinds of infrastructure would be needed, as well as what kinds of support for the innovators from a legal perspective might be worthwhile so that they could avoid being challenged by uh, some of the established institutions? Okay, uh, well, uh, first of all, I wanna apologize that my computer just suddenly went black. So I'm on my phone now. Um, and I, I just wanted to very quickly finish the, the previous question that I was answering that, that a patent is a patent. Um, so the, the utility patent standards and rules and the way they work for everything else would work for any new vaccine or therapy. Um, and you would have all the same issues. You would have patent thickets and, and um, potentially um, holdouts and, and you know, these long patent terms and so forth. Um, so, you know, the, all those issues are there. In terms of a maker space, here, let, me, let me get seated somewhere. In terms of a maker space, um, what you would need is, you know, just the same kinds of equipment that you have in any pharmaceutical uh, laboratory. But right now, you know, most pharmaceutical laboratories um, are sort of these privately owned ventures that are contracted with um, a major pharmaceutical company, or they are facilities that are just wholly owned uh, by the pharmaceutical company. So they're not letting um, average people, even people who are biochemists and have that background, come in and work on developing things. Um, there are also university laboratories, but again, you know, there's nothing like a, a makerspace where just anybody who has um, some ability and credentials can come in and use whatever equipment is there. Uh, you know, and, and there are reasons why those things have to be tri tightly controlled as well, but um, there are ways that that can be kind of overcome uh, in terms of the regulatory process to say that, you know, we're going to have a space that people are, are able to come in and work and develop things. Um, So, you know, what that would require, I, I don't entirely know. Um, but, you know, I can certainly envision that whatever the kind of spaces that a pharmaceutical company modernly is using to um, develop drugs, and, and every major pharmaceutical company has facilities where they're working on lots and lots of different things, um, you know, there's, there's standard equipment and standard production processes and so forth. Um, and that is something that I think could be uh, made available in a way that people who have an appropriate technical background but aren't employed by one of these companies uh, could come in and work on something and develop something um, and maybe manufacture some quantity of something um, as long as it's kept to the same kinds of constraints that uh, the large manufacturers are subject to um, in, in terms of inspections and quality facilities um, that meet whatever the regulations are. So yeah, I think that's that's something that's possible and that's something that could certainly move forward um, the development of some uh, technologies and therapies. I will say that all the big pharmaceutical companies are working tirelessly on developing these things. Um, so it's not necessarily the case that um, there are things that are of broad public applicability that are gonna go undeveloped if you don't have uh, kind of maker spaces available. 
but certainly those would facilitate uh, the production of genericized medicines and so forth that uh, the manufacturers, the, the large companies have no incentive to kind of uh, produce in a really cheap way. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Well, thank you very much, Brian, for that response. And this has been a fascinating salon where we were able to delve into many areas of law, policy, medicine, and indeed the core questions of how we can accelerate the progress of technological innovation for the benefit of human longevity and human health. I'm quite pleased that you were able to join us today, and I would encourage our viewers to check out the National Vaccine Law Conference, because that is an event where leading thinkers in these areas converge. And thank you to Brian. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to our viewers for an excellent conversation. And until next time, I hope that you all live long and prosper. <laughs>